So, so this morning, as, as, uh, as Christopher just said, we, we're going to talk about um, a new, uh, the emergence of a new sector, which is, uh, which is the social business or social entrepreneurship sector. And this sector has born, uh, was born uh, something like 30 years ago when Ashoka, who is uh, with, uh, the, the largest network of, of social entrepreneurs in the world, decided one to create this name you can believe it or not but until uh, until uh, 1980s there was no specific uh, name for for those people who are putting their entrepreneurial qualities at the service of the common good and are trying to really put the, the resolution of a, of, a, of a social problem as a primary goal of the organization and companies. So Ashoka decided to call them social entrepreneurs. And by social, you need to understand that it's, it's not just about people, it's also about the environmental, environmental uh, issues. And by entrepreneur, you need to understand that it's not just about creating economical value, it's, it's, it's about having the ability to, 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 to change systems and to invent new models. And in that regard, uh, we are uh, relating to the Schumpeter's uh, a, a, a theory of economy and the, the, the crucial role of the entrepreneur at the very core of it. So, so this morning, we will be uh, going through two, two main topics. The first one will be uh, to explain a bit further uh, what is social entrepreneurship, and we are lucky to have uh, uh, several examples uh, uh, within the panel. So they will be going through uh, their ventures, what they do, what is the type of impact that they have at the moment, what is their economic model, uh, what is the way they also evaluate the social impact of their organizations, and we'll be also talking about the challenges in terms of getting funds, getting investors, and developing uh, the, the, these new models. That will be the first part of the of the session and then on the on the second part we'll be uh, talking about the, the the convergence of both the social and the business sectors uh, i think that the previous panel was quite interesting in seeing that corporate philanthropy is becoming more and more mainstream and that more and more corporations have, have understood that they, they had to to, to put a, a social component uh, within their business model but this is a, this is not the core obviously and but there is something which is now emerging, which is, which is bringing both major companies and social entrepreneurs to really create new alliances, to really invent new models that can both deliver social impact and create economic value. So that will be, uh, that will be the second part of the discussion and we'll be illustrating this uh, with several examples of those new ventures or joint ventures that exist across uh, the, the globe. And I think that an interesting part would be also to, to, to see how those models who are in general dedicated to the, to, the, to the third world and developing countries can really well apply uh, as well in, 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 in developed countries. And uh, I think that the so-called developed countries are now in a transition uh, time and that will be very interesting to see how we can learn actually from others and from countries where actually by necessity uh, people have come up with interesting new ideas. So that will be the plan and obviously we'll have uh, some, uh, some time for, 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 for some discussions and questions but because I, I can see that you are maybe a bit tired and I don't know why is that but uh, probably the, the, the night was short uh, and I don't know if you noticed but we have a sport teacher on the on, on stage and uh, if you noticed you will probably see that there is one guy with red shoes and this guy with a social entrepreneur that I will be introducing in a minute uh, was happy to give you a very short uh, course just in, uh, in order to make you be a bit more energized so I'm more than happy to introduce Jean-Michel Ricard and then we'll start the discussion thank you, thank you. Michel. so I'm sure that now we have all your attention uh, <laughs> So it can seem to be a funny thing, but you will see that in a minute that actually how interesting and can, can that sport activities and physical activities can be in the well-being of, of many people around us and in corporations in particular. So uh, I'm now glad to, uh, to go through the, the round of introductions of each of them. So I'm going to ask uh, each of our participants to, uh, uh, in, in, a, in, in two minutes, just to introduce themselves, say what they, what they are currently doing with the organization so you will have a better understanding of what they do then through the course of this, um, of this session we'll have the, the opportunity to deep dive into each of their models and to really understand what, what they are doing. So maybe we can start with you, um, Martine, and if okay. you could tell us who, who you are and what you do. 
OK, bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Russell Adam. For 20 years, I was a CEO. I created and developed two companies in the fields of uh, uh, remote information and uh, counseling. I started from scratch, and then we uh, merged with a big uh, company uh, uh, on the stock market. Uh, and in 2005, I sold both companies and changed my professional life. And now I have two main fields of activities. First, my commitment in the field of social entrepreneurship because I, I'm a strong believer in uh, this uh, social entrepreneurship through Ashoka. At the time when Ashoka was created, I was still a company manager. So we supported the, the launch of Ashoka in France at the time. And uh, through a uh, solidarity-based um, capital risk company, we support not classical companies, but social entrepreneurs and uh, social companies. And my second field of activity is an association that I created called Schema d'Enfance, which supports local associations, essentially in India, to help uh, children in need and to uh, widen the help offered, i.e. not only to meet with their material needs, but to fulfill their holistic means, uh, if I may say, because it's a word that's been used here on several occasions. So we uh, fulfill their emotional needs, spiritual needs, uh, physical needs, etc. Everything that's required to make a child happy. Thank you. We are lucky to have you. You, you, you flew across the ocean to, to, to come exp especially for, for, for today. And I would love you to, to, to really um, explain what, what, what you have done. You are a serial entrepreneur, both in the business and now the social sector. Uh, Gonzalo has been, uh, has been elected as an Ashoka Fellow uh, last year. So uh, I would be very interested in, in knowing you know, what you are currently doing and, and understand what, what was your path in to, 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 to come up to there. Thank you. Well, um, first, as my definition starts, I'm a father of three fantastic girls, and I'm tr tremendously well married. And uh, that drives me to the path as well, right? Uh, I was uh, CEO of traditional companies in Chile and Argentina, being, let's say, successful, as the, as the society declares. And uh, one day, I had the terrible and the uh, uh, opportunity, well, but was terrible to listen to Mr. Manfred Maxneff. That was about three years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and I understood him, right? That was the problem because uh, many people, well, and, uh, and I also met Rodrigo Jordan, uh, who inspired me a lot. And uh, I, I decided to move apart from the traditional sector. My, my boss at that time keep on asking me what happened to me. Uh, Yesterday, I received an email from his son who wants to work with me. So, so that's very round, right? Uh, one of my problems is that the traditional, the, the traditional sector is not, and it, is a, it has been said many times here, is not uh, being accountable for, for the needs of the people. And I was very uh, unhappy with this type of success. And so one day, I decided to move apart. And my definition was, w what happened? if the private sector can solve public problems. I mean, I noticed many smart people working for making money and driven to, to that success. And I was doing just a simple question. What happened if that guy, instead of waiting for the weekend to try to be a good person, uh, works all, all the week for improving life? And uh, I decided to, to take that, that step. And I founded a, a company with a big friend of mine who died last year, so I bring it to the room. Joaquin uh, was very encouraged in this, in this concept. So we founded a company with really triple bottom line. And when I said really, that meant that we had to do very strong family adjustments, right? Uh, I, of course, I couldn't 
earn as much money as I was earning in the traditional uh, companies because uh, I wanted as well to increase the level of income of the people that, who was working with me and being able to measure those social and environmental impacts inside the business, but really with, uh, with, with power, you know, not, not lying and not really looking for only the economic uh, impact or profits. We measure the, the triple bottom line and in, in that situation what we wanted to produce was a kind of example for many other uh, business people. What happened was that two years later, we, f we discovered that we were tremendously naive because there were people like Ashoka that were working for 30 years and we thought that we were inventing the wheel. And um, we joined the big track of social entrepreneurship in, uh, in the world actually we are the first benefit corporation certified in South America. We were the first one in the Southern Hemisphere. So we really believe in the power of changing the definition of success in business, changing the ADN of the businesses, because public sector is important but not good, not, not enough to solve those big problems. And, and the dimension of the problem is the dimension of the opportunity. Thank you so much. We'll come back in a minute about the w your activities, what, what you currently do and how you manage them. Uh, Jean-Michel, so you saw, he's, a, he's not only a sport teacher. I, w I was a bit kidding. Uh, he, he actually he studied and graduated from a, 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 a sport university in France, but uh, he decided a few years back to, uh, uh, to, to undertake uh, a path of, of becoming a, a social entrepreneur and to create uh, one of the most powerful organizations in this sector in France today, which has expanded to, to, to other countries. Uh, Jean-Michel, est-ce que tu veux uh, nous, nous expliquer? Jean-Michel, could you briefly, briefly, because I know you can speak a, l a long time, could you briefly tell us what Ciel Bleu does? What's the impact of the company? And then we'll come back to the details later. Well, good morning again. My name is Jean-Michel Ricard. I'm co-founder with Jean-Daniel Mugler of uh, an association called uh, Ciel Bleu, S-I-E-L. That means Sport Initiative and Blue Leisure. It's an association that was created of, at the end of our university studies in Strasbourg. We were supposed to enter uh, the uh, national education uh, uh, system, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted to use our training f to work on prevention, to increase the impact at uh, little cost. We wanted to improve people's health, we wanted to, to improve um, cognitive uh, functions, work on uh, the capacities of people, we wanted to strengthen uh, the social bonds, improve uh, people's happiness. So we started working with the elderly in pension, in uh, retirement homes. We started with that. And little by little, we were lucky enough uh, to get the support of doctors and the health sector. And little by little, Ciel Bleu developed to work with other people, young pensioners, and then uh, people with mental or physical handicaps. And now we're working with people with chronic diseases, cancers, HIV AIDS, uh, um, uh, albus sclerosis, working only through adapted physical activity. To us, it's a, a therapeutic approach. Uh, not, we don't use drugs. Some labs created drugs uh, a century ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, homeopathy uh, came in. But what we want to offer is a therapeutical service without uh, using drugs. Now, uh, our association and all uh, the bodies working with us uh, works with 70,000 people in France. In we have about 350 employees. We work on prevention uh, with uh, young employees up to uh, dependent uh, elderly people. 
So we've also created uh, uh, bodies in, in Ireland, in Spain, in Belgium with different partners. So our aim is to create a virtuous economic circle, economic circle that benefits people, of course, but also uh, the community as a whole. If we want uh, financial tools to allow us to develop, about 7% of our budget is allocated to research. But um, financial profit to us is not an end in itself. So we were lucky enough to be amongst the first uh, bodies uh, uh, rewarded by Ashoka six years ago. And so in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. Very well, perhaps we will continue, and then I'll come back to Gonzalo. Perhaps, can you explain to us what the different activities are? Um, uh, what are the different problems, in fact, and what is the health prevention activity? What are the different activities undertaken by Ciel Bleu? And how, how is this happening practically when people move to a retirement home? Uh, what happens when some 70 or 80,000 people on a weekly basis uh, need to be processed? And how, what is the uh, experience that you have drawn from this? Well, all the uh, actors are really um, PE teachers, sports teachers, as uh, I am. So if we go to a retirement home in France, uh, they, they have integrated so far the Ciel Bleu activities, which is a special um, physical activity on a wheelchair, specific uh, physical activity for Alzheimer patients. Fifteen years ago, when we talked to the uh, uh, health sector in France, um, we told them then that this the problem when an elderly person gets ill, it is really very difficult for this, not only for the person, but also for the family, and especially in the case of a fall, elderly people fall. So we need to be preventive here. We need to make sure that elderly people still accept to take risks, and even though they lose part of their activities, but they have to continue going outdoors. So the fall prevention program was set in place in, in Strasbourg, and we encourage people to participate in a collective activity to, that would draw them outside the home and make sure that they could continue with a physical activity according to their needs. And this preventive program enabled us to reduce by 50% um, in Strasbourg the um, percentage of falls. And so this is very important because once you break your, um, uh, your hip in, in France or in Europe in, in general, this costs some 50,000 euros for hospitalization, etc. So the preventive program is very efficient also in financial terms. Another example, we have a, another program called GPS Health Santé. This is uh, uh, the, the shareholder is Ciel Bleu, of course, and all the uh, profit go back to our association, which will enable us to continue our public interest uh, programs. So GPS Santé is active amongst uh, enter, uh, enterprises, companies, to uh, limit musculoskeletal uh, diseases, which represent some 70 percent of uh, in the aging population in Europe. And so we've started doing warm-up exercises on building sites. One morning at 7 a.m., we went to a building site. We said, well, most of the accidents on building sites happen on a, in a straight line, not, not from fault. So what we are suggesting are warm-up exercises, which take some 12 minutes. And they will warm up, but not, but not just joint and muscles. And uh, the... Uh, leader of the building site uh, said, well, are you out of your mind? And we managed to convince him that of the importance. And then after a week, they all participated. Every worker on the building site, even the leader of the building site participated. And this company, it's Wig in France, we, uh, asked, then asked us to introduce it on 100 of their building sites. And they were, have been able to reduce by 85% the accident rate in France, or accident rate from building sites. Um, and we are now talking to uh, major di distributors, the post office, uh, agricultural uh, companies, uh, the French Railroad, etc., which also helps us to fight overweight uh, for for the public railroad, for instance. Uh, this is important. And the interesting thing is that the employee sees an advantage for himself. The company is uh, also sees an advantage because there's less uh, uh, abs absence for illness. 
and then there was also reduction of accident rate and so therefore the public health system is also benefiting from it so everybody sees ciel bleu from a very on a very positive side and let me give just one more example this is a new program we just started a few weeks ago it used to be one of the uh, leading programs in the cancer um, fight uh, fight against cancer and we did this together with the curie institute and we decided that usually when people uh, have a chronic illness, the elderly people, they have Alzheimer's, diabetes, uh, chronic pathologies that we have to work on together with doctors. And then we decided to move on to cancer. So during chemotherapy, for instance, uh, we've set up a program uh, which uh, fights fatigue, which um, uh, helps on the, uh, um, for the, the pain management because it is, uh, and, and together with the Institut Curie in France, we developed a brand because we wanted it, just like Ciel Bleu, it become an activity, a public interest activity. And the program is called Active, and it is uh, also for women with breast cancer. So there is usually a, uh, um, a baseline um, that is uh, examination which is carried out, and then we come in with the physical examination three times a week, it's, uh, specific exercises. And we have seen that this enables us to have the um, uh, secondary cancers uh, from emerging. So this is the, it has the studies evidenced, we, and the next step would be to have a um, move to prostate cancer, lung cancer, uh, or colon cancer, where also physical activity can be beneficial. And the next step. Uh, is that for, especially in doing chemotherapy, it needs to go together with physical uh, activity. In fact, the, if you, when you add physical activity, you can uh, diminish some of the chemicals within uh, the chemotherapy. So if you have, um, an, and if you have, a, if this increases the life quality, you know that there are fewer secondary effects from chemotherapy, and with the physical activity, the person feels better. And as to the cost factor, this is not 1 to 50, but 1 to 100 or 200. I'm talking in terms of um, uh, cost reduction. So this brings me back to Ciel Bleu and its activities uh, with the uh, business world. And um, so the, we, we discuss this within the um, business world and with the laboratories. And of course, the laboratories are not very happy about our programs. but. Of, of, of those social entrepreneurs and, and what they come up with, uh, with sometimes very simple ideas, but the combination of, the, of their passion, the combination of their commitment, and uh, their uh, generosity, I would say, as well, in terms of economic models, etc., and we'll come back to that in a minute, uh, is, is what makes social entrepreneurs and social organizations, uh, social, uh, yeah, social, so, so, social uh, enterprise, so, so interesting. Gonzalo, uh, you, you told us that um, you were your regular uh, CEO or business entrepreneur beforehand, and you de decided to create Triciclo. Can you explain a bit more what is the, the activity of this organization? Okay. and what is, in your opinion, the, 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 the impact that you can have on the entire ecosystem you know, of, of, of the business world in, in your country or region? Sure. Well, Triciclos, uh, first, as I told you, is an example of a business model settled in the triple bottom line. And, uh, and what we do, actually, our main activity is creating tools for sustainability. What happens is that many people say, OK, I want to be more sustainable. I want to take that step, but I don't know how to. I don't know. Many times, in mainly in our countries, uh, people don't have the culture enough, uh, enough culture. They don't have the tools. Uh, sometimes it costs too much. So we have achieved many different activities and creating tools for sustainability. Probably the one that is most uh, recognized, actually, in South America, is that we created a tool for solving 90% of the waste problem. Right. So we. We created a tool. Indeed, is a kind of facility in a full container, in a, in a sorry, in a maritime container, a 40 feet maritime container that can be placed everywhere. And and going through that, people can s reduce 90 percent of their waste problem. But it's not only that as a, let's say, a, as a uh, environmental impact. Right, it is evident. The thing is that in that activity, what we create is mainly uh, responsible consumption. What we 
activate in there is the knowledge and the distinctions for people to understand that waste doesn't come from somewhere. It's us. It's our decision to live surrounded by waste and creating this social negative impact related to waste. So uh, what we do is that we have calculated that if we think about the waste problem, probably 20% of the problem is in solving and recycling the waste. 80% of the problem is upstream, right? It, it's related to where it comes from. So what we do then is that we empower people to take better decisions while buying and while hi uh, hiring uh, companies. And actually we're also advising companies on designing products, production systems, uh, selling products, actually have a very high and strong campaign with the retailers in Chile to reduce. If you think about the three R's, re reducing, reusing, and recycling, recycling is the last. And that's because of something, because it has to work for reducing. And then what we do is that we also create the facilities to recycle some of the products that are not being recycled just because there's no enough volume or it doesn't generate the profits for being recycled. So we identify that 90% of the garbage can be recycled, but only 15% of it goes to the recycling process because it generates profits, right? So what we do is that we create those facilities. So we create facilities for losing money. Well, maybe we do crop subsidy in those materials that can create profit. They benefit those that do not create, but mainly our main purpose is achieving those, that 90%. And once we do that, then we create the reports for the government to establish poli public policies, right? So it's not only creating a certain uh, business, it's understanding that the profits are in the three levels, not only just looking for the economic value will lead us to this type of event. And uh, we need to achieve those social and environmental problems, and then we can, from the private sector, bring that solutions to the public sector so they can understand the problem better. What is the, what is the size of the company today and what, is, what are the plans for the, for the future? It was created in 2009? 2009, we started in 2009, we created it. So we dreamed and, and prototyped for all that year with Joaquin and then two other partners joined. The first Punto Limpio, this facility was established in uh, May 2010. We ended last year with five Puntos Limpios in Chile. Actually, we have 15, we'll end with 30. Uh, we have started in Colombia and Argentina. We're establishing offices in Brazil as well. Uh, and, uh, and actually, the, the size of the company in economic value is uh, we're getting up to uh, $1.7 million sales. We have actually 35 people employee. We'll finish this year with more than 60 we're getting up to a population of more than 25,000 people, and we're solving, because I, I, something that I didn't mention is that m some of the, of the labor that is created in this solution is by inclusive businesses, right? So we're solving also the problem of waste with an inclusive and social impact. And we're solving the, the let's say, the social problem of waste pickers in Chile in many regions, and as an economic value, we're creating facilities for uh, recycling uh, mainly plastics all around Chile, be, let's say from, uh, it's about 3,000 kilometers. Thank you. I think it's, a, it's, it's a, an interesting example of how social entrepreneurs have a holistic view on solving things, on not, uh, not just launching a new product or a new service, but are really thinking globally in terms of uh, reducing the, 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 the not only the waste issue, but the way governments, companies, and the civil society come together and can really be, become co-creators. Uh, and in, 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 the, in the example of Jean-Michel, I think that we really see that it's not just about uh, warms ups and uh, as, you could as you could experience, it is, is it's really about changing the perception of health and, uh, and going from a curative approach to a preventive approach, which is huge. And we'll come back in a second about how to evaluate this impact. But Martin, um, I, I'm going to turn into French now, but is, is it, has it been difficult to invest, uh, as you do for Filtrust, is it difficult to invest in these uh, strange social 
enterprises which are about to change the world, which have some strange business models or different business models. So what is the approach of a, uh, of a venture capitalist? Well, it, may be, it might be more difficult because it's something new. It's not a traditional business model, but it's a fascinating world because uh, we see that there are projects such as Gonzalo's or Jean-Michel's, and, and, and there's a range of other projects out there which uh, are based on the wish to change the world, and this happens in uh, whatever the, the field, ecology, education, housing, health, etc. So every time there is um, a, a specific study that can be organized, and there are probably some 70 or 80 percent which are um, models, and we see that they're based on, on, on strange ideas and uh, that uh, um, they will not lead to the uh, um, real company. But then there are others which can really lead to a uh, project which uh, can be integrated in a business model. And our role as uh, an investor is very important because not only on the selection level, but even even people who have been rejected tell us, well, this has been very helpful thing because there, there has been a lot of, of uh, uh, reflection and discussion around the project. So even people's pro uh, some projects which are not being selected are grateful. Then our role is also, uh, well, we are an investment group, so our role is also to select um, the final projects, and uh, very often there are um, questions that uh, there needs to be more feedback. Then we decide to invest either capital or uh, debt, and perhaps we can invest a little bit in order to help a person to uh, finalize the project. So it, it's really tailor made, it's a tailor made investment, and uh, we need to meet the person. That is a vital criteria because the uh, um, project initiator, and this in fact is the case in a traditional business model as well, but you need to see the initiator and his team. These people have to be passionate, they have to stand behind their project, they have to understand that it's difficult and they need to be totally committed to the project. Then uh, we sort of follow up or, or um, the, the project. There will be a member of our group who is, who is going to be um, the um, um, will accompany the, the, the project, the moderator of the project. And during this follow-up period, there is uh, not only financial follow-up, there is also the follow-up of the social or ecological impact. And this is the difference compared to classical traditional venture capital. Uh, now, we've discussed this um, previously in um, this meeting. It is not easy to measure this in uh, mathematical terms, um, but every time together with the person who is in charge of the follow-up and the initiator, rather, sorry, the initiator of the project, what uh, we discuss his objective. And for Jean-Michel, obviously, it's going to be uh, prevention in health on health issues. Okay, now how are you going to do this? Better housing, fine. So this would be. Um, um, low-income people who would have access to housing. And how are you going to go about this? So every time there is a, num a range of criteria which is being defined, and uh, we are measuring according to these criteria the same as the time we are measuring the financial impact. So we have this list checklist, if you like, or a list of uh, criteria um, that we follow. Now, for the uh, solidarity investment, we, there needs to be financial return, obviously, but which is only going to be three, four, five percent, maybe, but which um, uh, can go in the medium or long term, but we will require a social and ecological return in, in, a, in the short term. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Michel, when you mentioned Ciel Bleu, you said you, you were an association. Okay, fine. So if you, if you say an association, that means you're based on, on, uh, on uh, volunteer contributions. That is not exactly the case. Well, how do you operate? 
perhaps you can tell us, speak also about the turnover and tell us where your funds come from. Well, we have no public funds, obviously, because uh, we don't really have a label. We're not active in the financial or in the health field or in the sports field. So the association, uh, our association is, uh, is uh, um, Uh, really chaperoning in a number of smaller associations and everything, the business dimension, the commercial dimension belongs to the, as, as the overall association, to all the partners, to all the uh, employees, etc. Now, as to our economic model, there's some 93% of our budget, uh, which is a payment for our services, for services that we provide for insurance companies or for uh, retirement homes or for the public sector, and the rates vary from one to four. Uh, again, this depends um, on the economic business model. If you're a private person and you uh, you know that, but well, obviously he's not going to pay the same price as an insurance company is going to pay. Uh, the insurance company will pay three or four times the price we charge an individual. And uh, the profit that will stem from this uh, activity will then go towards other programs. Another business model for GPS Santé will be reverted to the uh, um, headquarters, which is uh, Ciel Bleu. And we've developed a common uh, brand we, with Croix Rouge, with the Red Cross. So, and the activities are being carried out by us. And 50% of the profits go to the Red Cross and 50% to Ciel Bleu. So this, again, is another uh, business model. We, so we use several models either based on partnership, and, the, and then the remaining 7% are partnerships with uh, companies, and the 7% is our R&D budget, really, which we cannot finance otherwise because we are an association. We, It's not a technological mm, innovation. Uh, we're active in the health field. so And this is why we have some links with some companies in order to uh, reflect together on these innov innovation programs. And thanks to um, uh, Chocard, which is, uh, if you don't know, well, we'll look it up on the internet, um, which also exists uh, in Switzerland, thanks to Arnaud. Ashoka is uh, really is stirred th uh, up the situation in the traditional Uh, solidarity programs, and we realize that the, the mind frames can change, uh, and uh, its ethics and values are outstanding. And thanks to Ashoka, we had an impact study, an economic impact study of our activities, uh, one linked to diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is usually occurs during 40 years old in a person, in an individual's life, and uh, the uh, um, fractures, um, hip uh, fractures especially in France. And uh, obviously, th this is a target population, of course, because this, and we realized that with the preventive program, this uh, will enable the public sector to save some 59 million euros uh, if they rely on the prevention program. And so, so we show that a very pragmatic approach can have a um, positive outcome for an individual's life and the public budget. Thank you for social the system, uh, social insurance system. Uh, Gonzalo, you, had, you were mentioning very briefly at the beginning that you are the only or the first B corporation uh, in, in South America. So it would be interesting maybe to tell you, t t tell us a bit more about what is a B corporation and then Uh, same question about the economic model and uh, and where you get your resources from. Okay, um, I'll mix those two answers. Uh, we really believe that the change must come from the for-profit system, right? We have to change the way companies act. So uh, when we when we wrote the statutes of Triciclos, we were quite rebel, right? When when it used to say A, we take we road set, right? And, uh, and, and the definition of that was trying to first uh, value more labor than money, uh, participate all the people in the, in, in, in the company, not only in the profits, but in the property, uh, trying to really imagine a business with a win-win equation and, and really win-win, uh, including the 
the, the concept of competence. And um, when we wrote that, we thought, again, we were inventing the wheel. Two, we, two years later, we found out that the, there is some, uh, a structure in, in, in that, that, that started in, in the US called the B corporations. B stands for benefit corporations. This is three guys that, that they sold a company while ma more or less at the same time when Ben and Jerry's was sold to Unilever because of this uh, hostile uh, option and, and when the, the, the first court decided that it has to be sold because it was a company and the profits is the first definition and the first fiduciary duty of the owners and of the board. So these guys, what they, they thought about what, what they were 38 years old with a lot of million dollars in the back, in, in the pockets and decided to change the model. And they define a new type of company, legally defined in actually nine states in the US. And uh, when we found that this exists, we said, okay, we wanna be a B Corp. And they say, well, it's not in our plan to, to go to Latin America. Okay, no problem, we'll do it. And we started creating the platform in Latin America for the B Corps. It's called Sistema B. Anybody, if, if you want, you can check uh, bcorporation.net. Is the, is the platform in the US uh, for companies that first have to have a mission on solving social and or environmental problems. Okay, that's first. Second, all the, all the governance has to attend all the stakeholders' interests, all of them. If I don't take a, a, an interest of a stakeholder in my decisions, I can be sued. And third, you have to work in a very high level of transparency. So finally, that definition, those three main steps that you can open that in a very uh, complex tree, but those definitions uh, really attempt to create a new uh, sector in the economy, really f enforce the, the, the fourth sector. And, um, and the, the process is very simple. You, you, you can apply in, in online and check if you have the 80 points up to 200. If you, if you are finally, if you have more than 80 points, then you can apply to become a, a B Corp. If you are in a state where that's law, then it's very easy. If not, as an example of Triciclo, then what we had to do is to send all those papers to the US and they, then Deloitte, the company, will audit and check if we were, and we became, in January, the first B Corp in South America, the first B Corp in the Southern Hemisphere. Actually, there are in South America more than 60 companies in the pipeline. The same day as we became a B Corp in South America, Patagonia, the, the, cl the close company, became a B Corp in California. Uh, there are, of course, social entrepreneurs becoming B Corporations and also quite big companies asking the same. Actually, I'm advising some companies in Latin America and some of them are very big ones. Um, so for us, it has been a very logical process that leads us to be very solid in our purpose of value and uh, had put us in a very happy position. So it's absolutely related up to happiness. In terms of the, the business model, we, we have no debt. Uh, we invested ourselves. Last year, we, pr we crossed the, the break even. Uh, we just grow with our clients and the products and services that we offer. Uh, we, we had uh, about, last year was 6% profit. Uh, then the profit, 30%, uh, one third of it, is reinvested in the company. One third um, it goes to the to the um, to the employees, and one third can be retired for for the for the um, for the partners. Thank you, and some of the partners are also some of the, all the all the employees of Triciclo can get participation, and uh, most of them can go through a process of getting part of the of the ownership of the company. Okay, thank you so much. I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that the so social entrepreneurship model is, uh, is, is really emerging and that is also facing some legal issues, uh, bylaws issues, etc. And this is why uh, this initiative of creating a new 
uh, a new statutes for, 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 for this type of corporation is really interesting. It is becoming kind of a virus for the, for, for the business sector as well, and we can see more and more of those uh, for-profit entities uh, becoming uh, this type of organization. So this transition is, uh, is quite interesting to, to witness, and, and I think that th now the question is how can we accelerate uh, this convergence between the, the, those two sectors, which brings us to the, to the second part of this session about uh, how big corporations or small corporations or regular for-profit corporations and, and, and social entrepreneurs can come, can come together. When, when you look at the impact of, of social entrepreneurs around the globe, and uh, at Ashoka we are quite uh, fortunate to have a, a network of more than 3,000 social entrepreneurs in 70 countries, we witness everywhere the same thing, which is that social entrepreneurs are probably the most innovative people when it comes to solve social issues. They have come up with very interesting ideas and solutions, uh, very efficient uh, solutions because they, they started as, as, as poor guys. And this is uh, a, a, few, a few days back, I was in a gathering of uh, international social entrepreneurs and one said, you know, the reason why we have invented those models is because we had no money. So we had to be even more creative in order to, uh, to, to really make change happen. And this efficiency is now something which is really attractive to, uh, to, to, to the for-profit sector as well. And uh, we can really see that if we really want to scale up the impact of social entrepreneurs, and that's, that's a common trend around the globe, social entrepreneurship by itself is no more sufficient and enough. So the idea is, is, is what is the type of alliances, the new alliances that you can build in order to really accelerate social change with people who can bring you processes, money, networks, and for, for which you will bring your innovations, your, 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 your ability to, to look differently at, at a problem uh, in order to scale, uh, scale, to scale up and to have a, 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 a total impact that will be more than the sum of the parts. So I think that it's, uh, we, 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 have, we have seen over the last few years a few, a few big companies uh, uh, undertaking this journey and trying to, uh, to, to, to create new um, new models and, and new partnerships with uh, with some social entrepreneurs one very famous one is is the the, the, the joint venture between Danone and uh, the Grameen Bank uh, when Frank Ribou CEO of Danone and and, and, and professor Mohamed Yunus came together and decided to launch uh, kind of a social business in Bangladesh selling yogurts for towards poor people uh, etc but we don't need to go to Bangladesh to have uh, in interesting ideas, uh, even with Danone. And I think that uh, Jean-Michel, you had, you have currently, uh, yes. Well, I do believe it's important indeed to mention this kind of initiatives. To say about that, so so Jean-Michel, uh, in terms of how you work with Danone, because a few, a few, a few, il y a quelques mois, pardon, il y a quelques, il y a quelques mois. A few months ago, you met uh, with uh, representatives of Danone. They wanted to establish a partnership with you. Can you briefly tell us uh, uh, this about this win-win partnership that's being developed? How does it work? What's the kind of relationship that you have? Is it a vertical relationship or a partnership? What are the products or services you're going to offer? Well. Uh, with Danone, I must say it's a, it was a great uh, uh, opportunity to meet them. They're a big company. Everyone's wearing a suit and a tie. Or we're not uh, on our side. They have, of course, specific uh, profitability goals. And we came with a very simple idea saying, you want to eat well. We want people to move well. So we're very pragmatic. Uh, we're sports teachers. So we say, we don't know what to do with you exactly, but we do believe there's something to do together. And we wanted to uh, benefit uh, the, um, the ones uh, who are going to use this service. So in the end, we shook hands and we said, well, we don't really know exactly what we're going to do, but we sensed that there was something to be done together. And from then on, for the past 18 months, we've really started working together. There's a global ecosystem fund that was created by Danone, and they've um, 
created a new uh, line of activity for Ciel Bleu, and it is there that we're developing. First, we started with Nutricia. It's the medicalized uh, branch of uh, Danone for very uh, fragile people. So they sell products. We offer services. We also noted that their products, these products were refunded by medical insurance. But if you don't do any physical activity at the same time, it's useless. So if they do not want Social Security to stop refunding their products at one point, they'll have to work with groups like ours. This is what they have to do if they want to disappear one day. So we're now offering packages, uh, medicalized nutrition, and our sports activities, depending on the needs and the pathology. So we work with retirement homes. We work in hospitals. We'll soon, soon start working at home to screen people, and to see how they are, what their physical activity level is, if they uh, uh, lack certain uh, nutrients. So for us, Danone is a toolbox. They have lots of uh, competences that we don't have. So we've asked them to train our employees to nutrition because there is a, a, a connection between eating well and moving well and between, between food and health. So they've come to train our employees that was essential. At the same time, they have marketing competences uh, that we don't have. So they're helping us with that as well. But at the same time, they've said to us, don't thank us because you're bringing us much more than what we are bringing you because we are bringing money, that's all. And well, a set of competences, of course, but you're bringing us a new uh, lease of life, some freshness. Because when they set up a working group, they launch a new product. Uh, they have only money in mind. They don't use their brain, really. They only buy people to think for them. So this is how we've uh, created innovative products together. My colleague has been training their future global leaders. Oh, it's uh, funny now because it's a sports teacher training a company manager, you know. So. We're providing them with new ways of managing their employees because our treasure is only our employees. So thanks to that, I do believe we can have an impact. And it's only the beginning. This partnership is very basic. And everything that's been done has been very spontaneous and easy. Mr. Ribou uh, said that this partnership with Selby is one of his best uh, partnerships and decisions. So they've helped us a lot. We're now creating a really interesting business. We're soon going to be in Spain and then in a few weeks' time in Portugal. And we were not there at, before. So we're going there with them to create a social business hand in hand with the group. We're going to offer, because there are major financial problems in that country, we'll offer uh, Ciel Bleu's services and Danone's products for free for a certain uh, group of uh, the population in Portugal, for those who will be able to pay, they will pay the, high, the highest price. We, we were supposed to have here with us today uh, the CEO of a pharmaceutical company, and unfortunately he couldn't make it, but he just wanted me to, to briefly introduce the partnership that we have designed with them. It's a, it's a multi-billion uh, company, family-owned company, a uh, German one, Bering Engelein, and um, 18 months ago, they came to us saying, okay, how, ca how could we partner in order to do something that would be good for our employees and for our CSR department? And we started a discussion, and, and very soon we came to the conclusion that actually we could not do anything for them. But what we could really do if, uh, if we wanted not only to take care of their employees, but really to think what could be the great alliance between a, a pharmaceutical company and social entrepreneurs was to look differently at the health sector, not through the lenses of a regular pharmaceutical company that you know invests a lot in research and development, then protects the, the, the patents and then uh, try to exploit them for years, but really 
uh, use social entrepreneurs in order to have their holistic view of where the, s the health sector is going and to, to really anticipate what's going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years. And as a result, what we came up with was to create kind of a research and, uh, research and development um, department uh, which, which, is, which is actually the support of 50 social entrepreneurs worldwide, which is the, uh, the, the, the opportunity for this uh, uh, pharma uh, uh, company to really understand what's, gonna ha what's happening currently in many countries around the globe and to really have an holistic view on the, 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 the health sector from the social uh, perspective. Then we have designed a specific program for the high potentials in order to send them uh, spend two to three months or six months within social entrepreneurs organization in order to really not only bring their competencies and skills but also learn from the field. And now we are in the process of seeing what, has, what is the type of joint ventures that we could invent between social entrepreneurs and this company. So it's quite of interesting to see that suddenly when you bridge those two sectors, uh, it's a it's a win-win situation, and you can really invent things that none of them would have been able to come up with individually. And this is really the the, the power of this thing. Maybe briefly, guys, we we are running a bit out of time, and I would love to to give the floor to the audience here who probably have many questions. Um, what is, in your opinion, the main challenge, you know, for this sector to really emerge? I think that Martin, you wanted to talk about the necessity of uh, yeah. communicating more and to, to give more of those examples. Can you share a bit more with, with us about this? Indeed. In all that's been said, I mean, all these projects are great, but we need to operate a real change of mindset. The world of companies, the corporate world is changing. 10 years ago, when we used to speak about social entrepreneurship, I remember meetings with the MEDEV people were gawking at us. They didn't have a clue what we were talking about. And today's meeting shows that there's a real will now in the corporate world to do something, to make things change. But to do that, you need a certain number of things. Companies need to know about these initiatives. Ashoka is publicizing them. The uh, Zermatt Summit does it as well. And there's also a certain press that's looking into that. We've seen it with Lacroix. There's an another press agency, Reporter d'Espoir, and you can uh, check their internet site. They've started broadcasting very positive information on all of this, knowing that we cannot just talk about problems. We should also talk about what's working well in the country. So they set up a database of 5,000 uh, projects, initiatives that offer solutions that are very positive in France and all over Europe. And based on that, uh, they're helping companies who want help or journalists to find information. So to come back to what's, what, what's been said, we've mentioned great success stories, but I do believe that in the room, there may be people that have uh, maybe not as developed companies, they're thinking, well, this is interesting. I'd like to do something, but what should I do? Let me tell you that I, for one, as a former CEO, we have a lot to, to give. The sector is becoming more professional. And people that have loads of ideas need people like us to just help them adopt a new business model. We can help them through our various networks, and we can support them, encourage them. This is what we're doing through Ashoka with the ASN. I mean, we won't have time to talk about it much, but it's the Ashoka support network. So we meet uh, company managers, uh, financiers, uh, advisors, etc., and we support social entrepreneurs uh, and fo to foster their development through venture capitals, for instance, or other things. There's uh, opportunities galore for those who really want to do something. That's what important. That's what's important. If we all commit ourselves to implement these kind of models, this is when things are going to move. Thank you, Martin. You want to say before we give the floor to the uh, well, I think the, the, the best challenge, I, uh, I agree that communicating this properly and uh, internally, I believe that the change must come from the boards. I believe that 
that the conversation in the boards must change. I, I had the experience of having many times the instruction to pay a sanction instead of investing in solving some social or, or environmental problems. And actually, we're having different type of conversations. Uh, one anecdote, one year ago, we started uh, having a conversation in State Triciclos about what's the competition for us. And how do we create a model of win-win real that includes the, comp the waste company that is going apart from our model? So how do we create the converting system for them not to lose, right? So really change the conversations in the boards. That's, the, that's our main challenge. Jean-Michel, a uh, point qui devient... Jean-Michel, does any particular challenge come to your mind? Well, we want more, more meetings such as this one. We want people to learn English, to better communicate, no more seriously. Um, let me tell you a little anecdote. We tend to think that, yes, we can. Anything is possible. One day, we were in a meeting with our employees. We were thinking about a specific problem. The solution was very simple. We had it in-house, as often is the case. We had a, a United States representative said, well, it'd be good for us to hear you, and it'd be good to get you to come to the States and tell people about what you're doing under the framework of the uh, reform of the health system. So this is something that can be done. But of course, we can't do anything by ourselves. We need win-win uh, partnerships and alliances. You may take it as a joke, but uh, we need to put men and women back in the heart of what we're doing. Our official time is off, but now we have lunch. Are you, do you agree that we spend five, ten more minutes? If you have any questions, I think we have some questions. So okay, merci for ces minutes supplémentaires. Malika Sarabhai, I wanted to know from all three of you, all four of you, one of the problems that we face in India is that there are a lot of us who feel very committed to the kind of social enterprise that we are speaking of, but when we start employing people how do we, or is it necessary, that we motivate them for the same cause, or are they just there as uh, employees? Would you start? Well, for me, it's a must. I mean, uh, it's absolutely a necessity. So we, first, we try to identify those people that exist, that are motivated for the cause. Uh, indeed, actually, I, we receive between two or three people per week asking to be employed in Triciclos, earning half of their actual income. Mm. So that's the reality we are facing. Uh, obviously, it depends on the type of job. But uh, first, I mean, trying to find actually a manager that can be really uh, committed to the cause is, from, from my experience, really easy trying to find uh, a basic uh, worker, uh, it's a little harder, but it will depend on how passionate you can, uh, you, you, you can transmit the, the cost, and it is perfectly not only possible, but needed. Thank you. Next question. There was. Can you tell? Dylan Valençon, je suis le président de BIS. I chair B Solidaire, a banking card company. You've talked about social entrepreneurship. How could you define a social entrepreneur? My first question. Second question is related to the first. Is this a specific type of corporate activity, or would you say that social companies are only defined based on their impact. If I may I'd like to answer, I believe the answer is, is, is in your question. We're now discussing, wondering what social companies are. 
Well, it's a world that's changing fast. The corporate world is moving to the social sector. The social sector is being is becoming more professional. So we can't provide you with a set definition. The only uh, solution is to use the impact. What's the first aim of the organization? If it is to have a social impact, if uh, the uh, business model aims at that, it's a social company. If the company creates uh, uh, financial value and every now and then has a social impact, it's a different thing. So when we're talking about social entrepreneurs, you know, they aim at solving environmental health issues to rethink systems, etc. No, but it's for that I give you exactly that one. So I do believe that the Western European administrations you were mentioning, mentioning have an absolutely absurd definition of social entrepreneurship at global level. You know that in India, in Africa, in Brazil, etc. It's uh, totally different. The uh, thing is, what's the impact of the companies? What are their practices? This is what Gonzalo was saying. This is all that matters. And is, it's only on that basis that you can judge the system, the sector. Uh, newspaper La Croix. Uh, I have a question on the, you know, we talked about the legal framework. Uh, now the, the new French government has a minister who is dedicated to uh, Economy Solidaire, uh, Benoit Hamon. And this is new, right? And I wanted to ask the panel here if you think it's uh, useful to have a minister dedicated to, to this uh, cause, or is it just uh, uh, something to look nice in the... I'm not, this is not a political question. It's just to ask you if you, you believe this is a, this is a, a good invention or, or uh, not necessary. Well, there's one group of people we don't like, it's politicians. So if they do something, fine. Well, let's wait and see. We're not going to hit them on the head uh, before they do anything. So just wait for a few months. Now, if, if they want social economy, I mean, we're part of the economy as, as such. We create jobs, we create wealth. We don't want anything specific for us. We just want to have the same rights as others. If we're an association, we want to be able to be uh, certified as a research organization. We just want the same rights. That's all. Nothing more. That's all that matters. Now, if uh, they walk the talk, why not? But it's a bit early to tell. Uh, I do understand what Jean-Michel is saying. Let's not uh, demonize social entrepreneurship. But this decision by the government is seen as a positive gesture because uh, this was something that was not acknowledged or recognized before. And now at national level, some people are going to work on that. But at European level, you need to know that a lot is being done as well. And I do believe that things are going to move with uh, public authorities, and it's bound to have a positive impact. So we will need to position ourselves uh, to make sure our ideas uh, move forward. Uh, Sorry, I'll incorporate another concept, please, yeah. easily. Uh, when I went to the university, I studied in three universities in different countries of the world, and only in one of them, I was taught one lesson of ethics. So. Once I realized that, I understood that everything else was not ethical, right? So my problem with that is not that it exists. It's fantastic that it exists. It's better that it doesn't exist. My problem is that that creates and validates what's not. It's the same thing with CSR. If you have a CSR area, that means that the rest of your company or institution is not socially responsible, and that's absurd. Thank you. Another, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a good statement. 
Is there another question? Yes. Yeah, this is Hamid Mushiki here from Essex Business School. Uh, someone has to ask a silly question, and uh, I, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not happy, but uh, I have to ask that question. Uh, I, and the question is: Is social entrepreneurship basically an attempt to patch a broken system and to um, give a, a chance to the the movers and shapers of the system? To feel, to feel good or less guilty uh, for all the uh, the downsides and uh, of capitalism, or is it a new form of capitalism, a new sustainable form of capitalism? Uh, this might sound a little bit philosophical question, but uh, for my profession, that kind of question counts. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, obviously, we, we, we won't go for the first option. Um, so some people can see that it's, it's kind of a patch, you know, it's just a nice thing to have. We strongly believe that it's going to be the next generation of, of businesses, and we can really see that the, this, uh, this, uh, this new era, you know, of, of combining both social and business activities is definitely what makes sense. In the first panel, it was also uh, mentioned, if you want to make your employees IP happy, it's not just about, you know, business. If you, if you I I it's, it's about bringing them something which is meaningful. And mean something meaningful has to be anchored in the core of your, of your, of your company. And, you know, Ribu was saying, the CEO of Danone was saying that the reason why he launched social business at the beginning was to, to retain, one, the, the shareholders, and two, the employees. So I think that the, the moment more and more companies would totally get that we are talking about something which is serious business, not just a ha nice to have, will be there. What is really interesting with social entrepreneurs is that suddenly um, they, they can really transform or translate needs in the needs of the world into a demand into business opportunity as well so if you suddenly look at the business you know as at, at, at the at the at, the, at the, 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 the the not the third world because i i, I don't like this uh, this uh, this uh, this name but you know the all the opportunities that are out there if you look in terms of uh, uh, if you can translate the the, the business opportunities in the, in the health sector in the food industry in and so on and so on. A recent study was coming up with, the, with, the, with the, the figures of six trillions of potential business at the base of the pyramid. So it, it's not just uh, doing, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, just a business to do good, it's, it's a very good business. Any last question? Last question, maybe? Mark, Mark Jewell. And that will be the last question and then we will be for lunch. Thank you, uh, Mark Drool from the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative. I have uh, a ref thinking about this and following a bit from Hamid's question. My question is this, does anyone on the panel think that in the long run we should continue to license companies that do not have a social purpose at the heart of their activities? And if so, why should we continue to license them as society? Well, I'm absolutely sure that the ecosystem will change. I mean, for me, the movement of the social entrepreneurship and the social company, yet not only entrepreneurship, because entre entrepreneurship leads us to a quite a small impact in my, from my perspective, right? <coughs> but social and environmental values in the core of the business is the only way for sustainability and the only way for achieving the personal happiness. So, so it, it brings us all the conversations of the all uh, panels that we have uh, heard here is, is, from my point of view, the, the main alternative that the, the humanity has to go on for solving the, so the globalization problems. Thank you very much. I would like to give a round of applause you, to all our panelists.